Good evening, everyone. So, I'm happy to be here with all of you. I am Chaitanya Charan. So, I am a monk from the Bhakti Yoga tradition. I'm based in India and I travel across the world. It's a little bit about me over there. So, <clears throat> I, was in tr I was born in a, in a devout Indian family, but I did my engineering from a prominent engineering college and I was never really interested much in religion or spirituality, although my parents were pious. But it's about for the last 25 years, I have been studying and sharing the knowledge of an ancient yoga text called the Bhagavad Gita. So today I will speak, oh, you want to operate that, yeah, life after life and the search for meaning. I will talk about perspectives in afterlife from the uh, Bhakti Yoga tradition, which is a part of the broad Hindu tradition. Before that, I would like to start with a little bit, uh, as I said, it's a search for meaning, which we all are trying to do. All of us want to have a meaningful life. <clears throat> About 25 years ago, when first I studied different religions, I read a very interesting book by Houston Smith, and he said that if you want to study any tradition, begin with two assumptions. That people everywhere are essentially similar. And people take to religion or spirituality as a support to getting on with the business of life. Everyone wants to move ahead with life. And they adopt some kind of worldview because it helps them to move forwards. So, how I started exploring this tradition in which, in which I was born but I had neglected. I will start with that and then I will move on to the topic. So when I was studying in my 10th standard in India, I was among the brightest students in my college. And in a particular category in my, exa in my exams in 10th, I came first uh, in, the in the entire state of Maharashtra. So Maharashtra is one state in India whose population is probably twice that of all of Canada. So, so I was elated. And the very evening on which in the morning I had got the result and the district collector of the, of the whole district, he came to my house to congratulate me and felicitate me and a picture of my family, my father, my mother, my brother and myself it came in local newspapers. So that very evening after all this happened, my mother was diagnosed with terminal blood cancer and within one month it was all over. So that shook me completely. Now here I was having achieved the pinnacle of success at that age and the next moment just shaken. So that was the time I started thinking and reading to try to understand what is life, what is death and we live our life taking every decision in a way that is very serious and meaningful. Every relationship that we form, every career move that we make, we see it as very meaningful. But by just one bug entering into our body or one bang vehicle hitting against us, our life can be just casually ended. So what is life? That's when I started exploring and I came across the Bhagavad Gita, which is a primary sacred text of the Hindu tradition. The Bhagavad Gita itself does not use the word Hindu. It gives universal spiritual principles. And I will summarize those principles, which I discovered over the years of study of the Gita in three broad terms. Evolution, elevation and emigration. So the basic point that the Bhagavad Gita explains is that, can you go ahead? So I'll speak on these three parts during the session. The first is evolution. Yeah. So evolution means it, the Bhagavad Gita explains that we are indestructible souls. Beyond the body, there is something spiritual, something non-material, and that soul is on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. That evolution is towards when we evolve. Where are we evolving towards? That evolution is towards eternal life and eternal love. 
now this could seem to be just like the dogmatic belief of some tradition it's possible and yet there are logical inferences which could point towards this can you go ahead if you consider all of us have a very deep longing to live forever and to love forever among the thousands and thousands of uh, say movies or novels that are written or made many of them are about romance and most of what is about romance is ending in happily ever after now if we look at the reality of life there is no ever after everything has to end in death sooner or later and even before that considering the kind of trauma that we experience because of relationships happily is also questionable but let's focus on the ever after now, why do we have a longing for this ever after when nothing around us lasts ever after even the huge mountains don't stay forever just a few weeks ago i was in new york and i passed by the place where the twin towers were before, earlier now when the twin towers fell it was not just the collapse of a structure it was what it represented security prosperity so when the twin towers fell the bubble of security and prosperity that had been built it crumbled now if nothing around us lasts forever where does our desire to live forever come from why should we have such a desire at all suppose there's a child living in some remote canadian reservation where there is no no internet no phone no connection with the rest of the world and suddenly one day such a child goes to his mother and says mom i want a pizza what do you think the mother would ask where did you hear about a pizza there's nothing in the child's environment which would prompt that child to know anything about a pizza if something is nowhere in the environment naturally the question comes up where does it come from if while going out of this room you suddenly found a gold bracelet lying on the ground immediately you would get the question hey, there's nothing golden over here where did this come from so similarly for all of us our longing to live forever is deep rooted within us but it's completely out of place with everything around us so where does this come from so what the ancient yoga text called the bhagavad gita proposes is that this comes not from our externals but from our internals inside us there is a indestructible soul and that soul which is eternal is the source of our desire for eternal life this is not a proof but this is a indicator it is a inference that can be reasonably drawn that our longing for eternity comes from a part of us which is eternal you go ahead so this is a conceptual representation of the model of the self that the bhagavad gita talks about it says our existence is three level body mind and soul these we could compare in the computer system to the hardware the software and the user when we work on a computer all that we see is the hardware similarly when we look at each other all that we see is the body the physical side but beyond the body beyond the hardware there is much more in a working computer system similarly beyond the body there is the mind which is like the software and beyond the mind there is the soul many of the mental health problems that we face in today's world they are like the corruption of the software of the mind now in this three level model of the self as i said what we observe externally about each other is the hardware the physical self with this model let us try to understand what is death can you go ahead 
So this another way of depicting is there are three levels of being. There is the body which is the outer layer, physical. Then there is the mind which is another layer. And then there is the core which is the self, the soul. And these three levels of being right now are also there. They are all together as one unit. Can you go ahead? But what happens at death is that the physical body is left and the soul along with the mind goes out and then from there the soul along with the mind will go to another body. So this death basically doesn't mean destruction of the self, it just means the separation of the self from its physical covering. That means we do not die, actually it is our body that is subjected to destruction and we move on to another level of reality. Now, this is how we are evolving, going from one body to another to another. And while we are evolving thus, the purpose of all this is evolution is meant to be upwards, we are meant to raise our consciousness, get better understanding of ourselves and our purpose in life. Can you go ahead? Yeah. So, let us move on to the second part now, I talked about evolution and now about elevation. So, the yoga text Bhagavad Gita, it explains, can you go ahead? Yeah. That our body is like a dress. So, and we get a dress, let us consider, say if you want to go and buy a new dress, what are, the, what are the factors based on which you buy a dress? There are two factors, the price and the preference, what you like and how much you can afford. So, in Sanskrit, these two terms are, Sanskrit is the language in which the Bhagavad Gita is spoken, it is the broad language of the many Indian Indic traditions. Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. So, it explains that the price is what, how much can we pay that is, that is what is determined by our karma. The word karma, how many of you have heard this word? It's karma. Yes, thank you. It is almost there in everyone in the mainstream English lexicon. So, karma often it refers to action and the reaction that we will get for the action. So, the kind of actions that we have done that will determine how much good karma we have and by based on that we can get a new body. Just like if we, are, we have a particular dress and we do some job, we work in that, we work and then the dress gets torn, then we have to leave that dress, we want to get a new dress. So, based on how much money we have earned and what kind of desires we have, we will buy a new dress. Similarly, when the soul leaves one body, you remember the previous diagram, the soul has come out of the body, the physical shell. The soul has to go to a new body. Which body will it go to? That is determined by these two factors. Kama and Kama means desire. So, that is that is you can call it as preference. What do we like? Just as we buy a new desire based on the price and the preference, the soul gets a new body based on its Karma and its Kama. The kind of work it has done and the kind of desire it has. And in this way, the soul moves forward. So, it's, now this is meant to lead to elevation of the soul. Now, we may wonder, okay, so when I earlier said we are dressed by and for our desires, what does that mean? The kind of desire we had in the past, that is the kind of body we have got right now. All of us have distinct bodies, even twins, they are physically similar, but they are psychologically dissimilar. The personalities are different. So, this difference, where does it come from? If we have identical twins, then their genes are also completely identical. I was in London giving a talk and there in the audience there were two identical twins. And when I explained this that they said that we are so different, one of us is introvert, other extrovert, one of us likes, likes dri driving, another likes music, they are very different. They were telling, that till now we could not figure out, why are we different? So, our personality is not just determined by the genes that we have got from our parents. It is not determined only by the kind of upbringing or the socializing that we do. It is also determined by the kind of soul 
we have and that is determined by where we have been in our previous life. So two souls may have identical dresses just like two people may go to a big uh, cloth stores and buy exactly similar dresses. The dresses may be similar but they are different people. So in the case of twins their dresses are similar but the persons are different. So when we go from we are dressed by our desires the kind of desires we had previously accordingly we get that dress and for our desires means that based on the desires that we have we are given the particular facilities to get a particular body. In fact the soul the Bhagavad Gita explains is present in every body in sorry in every living being it is not just humans even in animals even in plants even in germs souls are present. Wherever there is consciousness, a soul is over there. Can we move on. So now, the Bhagavad Gita explains that the the go journey from one body to another body that is determined by something which can be called as the law of last thought. Zanta kale chamaameva smaran muktva kalevaram ya prayati samadbhavam yati nasti atra samshaya. This is Sanskrit in the Bhagavad Gita eighth chapter. What it essentially says is. That what we think of at the time of death, that is what we will get in our next life. And what will we think of at the time of death? What will be our disposition at the time of death? That will be determined by what we have been thinking of throughout our life. What we have been thinking of throughout our life. If somebody loves their dog very much and the dog loves their master, then it could be that the end of the life the dog and the master may find themselves at the opposite ends of the leash. The master may become the dog and the dog may become the master. If the master is very attached to the dog, if the owner is very attached to the dog, the owner thinks of the dog at the time of death, the owner may become a dog in the next life. The dog is very attached to the master, the dog thinks of the master at the time of death, the dog may become a human being in the next life. So this is how this journey takes place from one life to another. Can you go ahead? Yeah. So now, when a person dies, in the broad Indian tradition, the body is <coughs> cremated, the body is burnt, it is not buried. And one reason for this is that the soul is given closure. That this because if we have lived if we have worn a dress for a long time, then even if that dress is worn out and we can't wear it now, we may still want to preserve it. This was a dress that I wore in my childhood. So like that, even when the body becomes unworkable, the soul has to leave the body and go to the next body. The soul can be very attached to that body. And because of that, the soul may not leave the body. So when the body is burned, it's put on a funeral pyre, and burned. By that the soul which is maybe hovering above with the mind, the soul is wondering is there some way I can enter into this body and I can live on. But when the soul sees that the body is irrevocably destroyed, burned to ashes, then that gives the soul closure. This life is over now. Now let me move on. So cremation is done so that the soul can move forwards and cremation is often done in a sacred place maybe on the banks of a river where there are sacred mantras being chanted and there are people are in a prayerful contemplative mood. Life is temporary and when we see the body burning to death that creates a certain level of sobriety. Okay, this is what I am going to become in future also. This is going to be the end of my body also. And that sobriety can inspire people to explore life's spiritual dimension more. So cremation serves a good a constructive purpose for both the person who is departing, the soul who has left the body, as well as for others. It gives closure to the soul who has departed and it serves as a graphic reminder of the inevitability of bodily destruction for those who are living. Go ahead please. Yeah. Now as I said 
is this just some dogma are there any ways in which we can substantiate this so, so there are many children across the world who have had past life memories <coughs> there are children who know things that they just can't know and these memories just spontaneously come up a child may be two or three and child suddenly says mom I want to go to my other mom what or one day the child may so say to his dad dad I am small now but I was bigger than you earlier what children speak like this uh, bolt out of the blue and when they speak like this it creates, creates perplexity among the parents but there are some scientists who have investigated such memories quite seriously can you go ahead so this is Dr. Ian Stevenson. He was a pioneer in the research into past life memories. And he, he spent 60 years traveling across six continents and he documented thousands of cases of children who could remember their past lives. And he found actually that the evidences were of four levels. They were recollections. Children could remember, oh, I was so and so boy over here. Maybe I could tell a story over here to explain this. <clears throat> so there was this boy in Turkey. His boy was, Nes his name was Nesip. And when he was growing up, he said that my name is Nesip. His name was Nesip Unlutas Kiran. And he says, I, my name is Nesip. Your parents, he says, your name is Nesip. No, I am Nesip Budak. He says, no, you are not Nasib Budak, you are Nasib Unlutas Kiran. And as he grew up, he was living in a place called Adan and he had, he said, I live in Mersin. And he said, I, my name is Nasib Budak and he was a six year old boy. And he said, I have a wife and I have children and I want to go and see them. His parents, they neither believed in the reincarnation, they didn't take care of, take it seriously. But as he started this from the age of three, four, five, six, as he grew older, he started saying, if you don't take me there, I will go alone over there. And finally, they took him there. Uh, his uh, father, his grandfather, his mother's father had got remarried to a woman who was from Mersin. And when, they, when his mother took him to meet his father after marriage, her father after marriage, and he started speaking like, oh, you're from Mersin, do you know Nasib Buddha? And he said, yes. You know, he had died in a, in a quarrel, in a knife fight. He says, I am Nasib Budak. He says, what? And he started telling many details about this person and she was intrigued. Now, all this was published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, which is a respected scientific journal. So then, eventually, his grandfather took him to Mersin. And he had never been to Mersin, but as soon as he came over there, he said, let's go left, let's go right, let's go right. And he took him straight to that particular place. And there, was a widow who was living there, a woman who had been a widow and her husband's name had been Nesib Badak. And then he started telling many details, you know, we did this and we did that and we did that. And so I said, first of all, recollections were there, but then there were recognitions. He recognized people over there. She, he had children from his previous life and he recognized the names of the children also. And not only that, he also had information of something quite confidential. This Nasib had been a very short-tempered person in his previous life. And one day, in a drunken rage, he had attacked his wife with a knife. And she had dodged the blow, but the knife had hit her thigh, inner thigh. And it had created a scar over there. So he told this, that she has a scar on her inner thigh. So, Dr. Stevenson had a female assistant. He took her uh, and he took this Nesip's wife or widow and they examined her. And she found they ha she had a scar on her inner thigh. And she said, Yes, my husband had attacked me at that time. So, he had now for a child living in an entirely different city, how would he know? of a mark on a private park of a, on a private on a private part of a body of a woman whom he has never met 
before not only that he was so possessive when he saw the ch children now the children were older than him but he was brushing their hair kissing them treating them with parental love all the children were older than him and his this nasib budak's wife widow she had remarried so when he saw his wife's photo with her husband her husband was not there at that time he got so angry he took the photo and was about to hurl it on the ground he said you are my wife no one else's wife so, so there were also behaviors and most significantly there were birthmarks so nasib budak in his previous life he had drunk and he had quarreled with somebody else and that person had also been drunk and, and as the fight got ugly the other person had taken out a knife and had multiply at multiple places stabbed nasib budak and that's how he had died now nasib ulluta skiran this boy whenever he would talk about his previous life he he was born with multiple birthmarks on his body that he had six birthmarks on his body and he would point to those birthmarks and say this is where i was stabbed and because nasib budak's death had been a uh, had been investigated by the police so there was a post mortem report and dr stevenson investigated that and he he decided to check how precise okay nasib had six wounds on his body and nasib had six birthmarks on his this young boy's body so he divided the human body into xy 160 coordinates and then he investigated how pre that how precise is the location of the wound from the previous life and the birthmark from this life and he found precise correlation so even one birthmark is very significant but here there were six birthmarks the probability of that would be 1 by 160 raised to the power of 6 it's a extremely low probability so when they, so this kind of cases can you go ahead so dr stevenson has written many books there are two of his books was one of his first books was 20 cases suggestive of reincarnation and his last books was where reincarnation and biology intersect that is where he wrote extensively about the birthmarks and birth defects can you go ahead so now the birthmarks they are quite dramatic quite uh, quite graphic so this is the birthmark that a child had right from his birth now this is not simply a mole or a scar or anything like that so what had happened this boy remembered that in the previous life he had been knocked down by a truck and the truck had run over his body the truck had run over his thigh so where the truck had run over his thigh that's where his thigh had become deformed over here so these are quite striking kind of birthmarks so these point to the idea that the same person the soul has gone to another body we go ahead please so now i'll talk about the last part immigration for the soul as i said is evolving and it goes from one body to another the idea is the soul is to go upwards just like if we have one kind of dress then we work with a, we work wearing that dress and we want to buy a more expensive dress a dress which we like more so that's the elevation ultimately the purpose of all this what are we longing for it's that this is the world of matter which is where everything is temporary beyond this is the world of spirit where everything is eternal and the purpose of life the bhagavad gita according to the bhagavad gita is that we emigrate emigrate from this world of matter to the world of spirit we go ahead so now what is there in that world of spirit that is characterized by eternal love <coughs> you remember i started the class with how there are so many novels and movies which talk about romance which talk about the happily ever after so there are when we talk about happily ever after there are two things we live forever and our beloved lives forever and then both of us can have a happily ever after so till now i talked about how this longing points to our eternality 
But along with that, there is not just eternal life, but there is eternal love. Eternal love means there has to be an object for our love. And that object is described as the infinite, the divine. The Bhagavad Gita explains that the divine can have many different names. And the Gita refers to that divine by the name Krishna. The word Krishna refers not just to a sectarian god, but literally it means this, that Sarva Akarshati Iti Krishna. That everything, one who attracts everyone, that is no that person, that reality, that truth is known as Krishna. So, what the Gita explains is that we are attracted to different people, different things. Somebody looks very attractive, then everybody gets attracted to them. Some, somebody looks very good, people are attracted to them. Somebody is very wealthy, people are attracted to them. Somebody is very intelligent, just remember and explain things brilliantly, people are attracted to them. Somebody is very famous, we are attracted to them. Somebody is very powerfully built, very strong, physically, socially, whatever, we are attracted to them. So there are different attractive features, beauty, strength, wealth, intelligence, fame. So all these attractive features that attract us to others, there is one source in whom all these attractive features are present in full. And that source is the ultimate object of love. So whatever we find attractive in anyone, we have two kinds of relationships. There are horizontal relationships and there is a vertical relationship. The horizontal relationship is with people around us. And the vertical relationship is with the divine. And the horizontal relationships, they are important, but they are temporary. They cannot last forever. But the vertical relationship can last forever. And the purpose of life ultimately is to evolve, to become elevated so that we can develop this vertical relationship. We can learn to love the divine. And when we learn to love the divine, that is when we attain the divine. Can you go ahead? So this process of loving the divine is called as Bhakti Yoga. How many of you have heard the word Yoga? Yoga. Yeah. Thank you. So now the word yoga, as most of you probably know, it is associated with physical exercises. That physical exercises that can make our body fitter and more shapely. To improve our health and our looks, people do yoga. However, the word yoga originally had a very different connotation. We consider in India, Today, most people practice yoga to, as I said, improve their health and their looks. But in the past, in the Eastern world, yoga was practiced primarily by people who renounce the world so that they could connect with the divine. So yogis would leave, the for leave their homes, go to the forests and sit in yogic postures and meditate. And the idea was, to perceive some higher reality. So yoga is essentially, the word comes from, if you consider its cognate of the English word yoke. You, when we put a yoke, then what do we do? We have, we connect an animal like a bullock with a structure by which the, by which the farm can be plowed. So yoke means to connect. So yoga and yoke are cognate. They come from the same roots. So the word yoga literally means to connect. It is meant to help us establish a connection. So the connection between the soul and the divine, the finite and the infinite. And bhakti yoga is the process by which this connection can be developed through love. Bhakti literally means love. Love for the divine or divine love. So bhakti yoga is the process by which the connection with the divine is developed by the power of emotion. Our loving propensity we direct towards the divine. And Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga is the most widespread among the various paths that are there in the broad Hindu tradition. And 
in bhakti yoga the idea is can you go ahead yeah that when we love the divine more than the world the divine takes us out of the world to the eternal abode so we all have different loves in the world you may love some people of some of us may love sports some of us may love food some of us may love video games some of us we all have different loves but the purpose of evolution and elevation is that we learn to love the divine and when we love the divine that is when we attain the divine so i'll conclude with uh, then since we are talking about life after life and the search for meaning i'll conclude with what is considered in our tradition to be the ideal death the ideal departure from the world one of the most prominent teachers of proponents of bhakti yoga in the modern times was swami prabhupada at the age of 69 uh, swami prabhupada came to america alone on a cargo ship with just 40 rupees and, and he didn't even know english very well he didn't know anyone in america when he landed in new york uh, he landed in america he didn't know whether he should turn left or right and he came as a messenger of divine love he came in 1965 and that was the time of the counter culture and he started sharing this message of love with people and 1 2 5 10 100 thousands and millions of people within a decade started practicing bhakti across the world and in by in 1977 he depart he passed away but in those 12 years he wrote over 70 books <coughs> he circumnavigated the globe 14 times on world tours where he spoke about the message of divine love he inspired over a million people millions of people to take up to spirituality he built 108 temples across the world and then he returned to uh, the a holy place in india which is called vrindavan it is in north india and there he he was diagnosed with a serious disease which was more or less seen as incurable and then in the last days of his life in vrindavan he was surrounded by people who were devoted the same god krishna to whom he was devoted and they would sing the names of krishna he would speak about krishna even till this last moment he was writing books by dictating the dictaphone and the, the those were published as his books later so he would hear about krishna speak about krishna when people would come to meet him one of his scientist disciples uh, came to meet him and he was shocked swami ji had earlier been very healthy and a uh, vibrant but he had become extremely emaciated and he had become so weak he had not been able to eat for days he had multiple complications including a severe urinary tract infection so he had become so emaciated like a shadow of his self so this uh, dr singh who was his disciple he came to be shocked and swami was so uh, so, so detached so spiritually aware he saw his disciple being shocked and he laughed he said for so many years i have been telling you i am telling all of you, you are, we are not the body we are the soul he said now i am demonstrating that my body is gone my body is just a shell but still i am here and then finally on november 14 1977 at auspicious time he was surrounded by his disciples and they were all singing the names of god we in our tradition especially sing the mantra hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare so they were all singing the mantra around him he himself is extremely weak is he was listening to the mantra and then he spoke the names of hare krishna hare krishna <coughs> he spoke this twice and then he closed his eyes forever a few hours before that a short while before that he had been asked by his admirers and followers do you have any last desires and he replied kuch ichha nahi is i have no desire left so he had come as a messenger i had come to serve 
the divine by sharing the message of love, he had done it, is contented and he departed from the world. Death is inevitable for everyone. But there is an art to dying. The Bhakti Yoga tradition explains that if you can die in remembrance of the divine, then we attain the divine. The bo body will suffer, it will get deteriorated. One of his followers, uh, he also died in a similar way, in a very sacred uh, situation. So what the, the all this, how does it apply to us? He says that, his followers saying that, that in life pain is unavoidable, but suffering is optional. What does it mean? Pain is unavoidable, but suffering is optional. Now, if we become spiritually aware, then we don't stay obsessed so much with the body. We may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. If we understand that our physical reality is like a dress, you know, if we have bought a new dress and suddenly it gets torn, we'll be annoyed, we'll be embarrassed, we may become angry also. But the tearing of a dress is not the same as the ripping out of an arm. So when we understand that we are spiritual beings, we don't get so affected by life's ups and downs. We can bring a steadiness, a calmness, a maturity to our life, by which not just at the time of death, but even during the journey of life, we can, we can face life with greater inner security, greater inner confidence. So this is that life can be meaningful if we attain the divine at the end of our life, but life can be meaningful if we connect with the divine even in this life. And that is the essential message of the bhakti tradition. So I will quickly summarize and if any of you have any questions, we can discuss. So I spoke today about life after life and the search for meaning. And I spoke this in broadly three parts, three E's. Does anyone remember the three E's? Sorry? Evolution. Elevation, emigration. Thank you. So, evolution is, I talk about we are souls indestructible on a journey of multi life spiritual evolution. Our longing for eternal life and eternal love points to something eternal within us. Just as a child who has never heard of a pizza in a remote village desiring a pizza or finding gold in a place where there is no gold. So, this longing comes not from our externals but from our internals. And I talk about the Gita's model of the self, the three level, body, mind and soul, they are like the hardware, software and the user. At death, the soul and the mind leave the body and go to another body. There I started talking about elevation, that the body is like a dress and we buy a new dress based on our, the price and the preference. So the price is the karma and the preference is the karma, our desires and how much we can, what kind of work we have done. So we talk about the soul gets a new body that is like a new chapter beginning in the journey of the soul and then i talked about past life memories which are indicators that all of us have a past and these past life memories there are multiple kinds of evidences there is recollections recognitions behaviors and birthmarks and birth defects stevenson's research i talked about and the story of nesapunlutas kiran and the six correlating birthmarks and then as we are evolving and we are trying to elevate ourselves, the purpose ultimately is immigration. Immigration means the world of matter is temporary, the world of spirit is eternal. The purpose of life is to immigrate to that eternal world and in that eternal world, there is an eternal object of love, that is the divine, known in our tradition as Krishna. So whatever is attractive in anyone, that is present in fullness in that divine. So when the process of connecting with the divine is through the process of bhak is bhakti yoga, where we chant the holy names and surround ourselves with impressions of the divine. And by that, as we become absorbed, attached to the divine, when we love the divine more than the world, and the divine takes us out of this world to the eternal abode. And <clears throat> Normally, when a person dies, there is a cremation so that the soul has a closure and the soul can move to the next body. But when there are spiritually evolved souls, when they die, they stay absorbed in the divine. And I talked about Swami Prabhupada's departure, where he had no desire left and he just 
gracefully hearing the names of Krishna, chanting the names of Krishna, he departed from the world. And when we understand that we are spiritual, that can not only create an auspicious destination in the afterlife, but even in this life, we can rise above our situations and our emotions. We may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. Because we will see physical problems like tears on our dress. But we are bigger than that. And we can stay situated in our spiritual secure, stay secure in our spirituality and march confidently through our life. Thank you very much. Some yeah, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, any questions? Any comments also are welcome. Yeah, please. You asked about the law of last uh, thought. Yeah. And um, like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to have a law of last thought? You're asking me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because you talked about Yeah, that's like true. Vice versa. So, what would maybe your attachment be? What would my attachment be personally? Well, I'm trying to develop my attachment to Krishna. As I said, I've been practicing this and sharing this process of bhakti yoga for the last 20 years. So, <clears throat> generally, we can find out what our attachment is by where our thoughts go to when we have nothing to do. When we have something to do, Naturally, okay, we are doing our studies, we are driving a vehicle, we are talking with our friends, but we are sitting and relaxing. Where do our thoughts go to? So that is like the home of our thoughts. It's like we have a home for our body, where we will go to naturally when we don't have any, any, anything else to do. Similarly, our thoughts have a home. So wherever our thoughts go to, when we have nothing consciously to think about, that is what our present home is. And that is what we will think about at the time of death. So presently, I, I can't say that I have great attachment to Krishna. But the Bhagavad Gita is a book which I have studied extensively. I have written for almost 20 years. So whenever I have some free time, I try to think of the Gita, recite verses from the Gita and contemplate the Gita. I have been writing on the Gita also every day for the last 7-8 uh, years. I have a blog called Gita Daily, just last night. Yeah, that is my blog. where. We have almost about <coughs> more than half a million followers from the Facebook page. So where I write every day on the Gita. So I am thinking of that, trying to understand the Gita and make the Gita understandable. So that is what I will probably think of when my last moment comes. But as I evolve further, the attachment to the divine increases by the practice of Bhakti. So I can see that my, what my attachments were 20 years ago and what they are now, they are evolving. So, it's, I am confident that as I keep moving forwards, I will become more attached to the divine also. Thank you. Yeah? Chaitanya, does the uh, International Society of Krishna Consciousness uh, maintain the belief in caste with priests and warriors and okay. merchants and shudras? Yeah, so, do we believe in the caste system? It, the word caste system itself has a very negative connotation. The Bhagavad Gita talks about a division of society and the word for it is Varna Ashram. Varna is not caste but you could say it is more class and it says it is by quality and activity. That means by disposition. So that the original system was that if people can be engaged according to their natural talents then there can be individual satisfaction and social contribution. Say, nowadays it happens that say if, if engineering is glamorized, everybody wants to become an engineer, even if they are not fit for engineering. So the original system was such that, <laughs> well, <laughs> I am also in that, I became an engineer although I had no interest in it. <laughs> so uh, the point was that the original system was so that people's talents could be identified and they could be engaged according to that. So the system of division of labor was according to quality and activity. That's very clear in the Gita, guna and karma. So but un unfortunately, 
over the centuries this became stratified and it became people became labeled by their birth and that is a serious deviation from the traditional teaching and uh, that is something which has led to terrible discrimination and indian society is especially in the urban areas it's outgrown it significantly and we are by no means supporting the caste system by birth in fact swami prabhupad opened the doors of bhakti not just to people in the lower caste but to everybody in every part of the world and he would say that god is not the property of any particular caste god is the guide of every single living being so in that sense the bhagavad gita itself teaches what we call as spiritual democracy it opens the path of spirituality to everyone thank you yes please would you consider somebody that's like thinks of their dog when they die it's like a really low level in their evolution like do you want to always become a human in your next life so you can think about these things okay good question so is somebody thinking of their dog at the time of death is it a lower level it's not a matter of uh, so much as lower or higher in a judgmental or a, a moral sense it's more in the sense of opportunity for growing see all living beings exist but it is only human beings who can question the purpose of existence why do i live the the vedic text explain the broad yoga text explain that all living beings are driven by four bodily drives to eat to sleep to mate and to defend so animals do this humans do it but we humans can do something more we also need to eat sleep mate and defend but we can think of something more why am i living what is the purpose of life hmm? so this capacity to question is there in the human human beings because the, as i said the soul mind and body are together as one unit but in the animal bodies the soul's consciousness is tied very much to the body it's tied so much to the body that the soul can't think of anything beyond the bodily drives uh, but in the human body the soul is still connected to the body but the soul's consciousness is somewhat detached from the body soul can think of higher things so the human body is more conducive for spiritual evolution than a uh, animal's body that's why human body is a is considered a better opportunity now we all need <coughs> love and our attachment to other people or even to dogs that simply is a expression of our longing for love uh, i was traveling in texas in america and i saw a bumper sticker on a person's uh, car he said the more i get to know people the more i love my dog <laughs> <laughs> so our the love longing for the love for dogs is simply uh ex- so if we understand our spirituality ourselves spiritually then we can also direct that longing for love towards the divine and uh, the dog can be one way in which our longing for love can be fulfilled but if the dog becomes the primary attachment or the soul attachment then it can be a problem the broad uh, spiritual culture uh, which is is derived from the bhakti yoga tradition it respects all life forms and even animals are seen spiritually so we don't neglect or minimize animals but if our attach primary attachment gets concentrated on, so attachment to dogs is not the problem but obsessive attachment that can lead to a uh, uh, obstacle in the spiritual evolution but if we see the attachment to a dog as an indicator of our longing for love and then we can direct our love spiritually then that can also help us in our spiritual evolution okay thank you yes yeah like instead of thinking by thinking about animals or people or why what if you think about fate like what if you guys think about money or something like that like what if your attachment was an object like okay so what if our attachment is to an object see generally even people who are attached to an object if we go deep into psychology we'll find that their attachment to that object is because 
of the hope that that attachment will give them some connection with someone why do people want money it's it's we we want money we want looks we want so many things so that we can become so that we feel we'll become more lovable in the eyes of others so if our attachment is to things then it's quite likely that that attachment to thing is because we think that thing will give me the love of someone so exactly the exact attachment to what we have uh, we are conscious beings so obviously we cannot become unconscious beings money is unconscious so when it is said whatever we remember we will attain that simply means what is our deepest attachment so the attachment to money is probably a reflection or a distorted expression of our attachment to something or someone that we hope we might have got with the money so whatever is our deepest attachment we'll go to if we are very attached to money then we might uh, uh, be born in another life where we have excessive craving for money so we all need money so for all of us money is a functional need in life but for some people money is the purpose of life and for some people money is the sole purpose of life so why this difference that's based on the kind of attachment they have okay, okay. yes yeah here yeah, please yeah. Um, so if somebody has done wrong um <coughs> is it does the soul like go into like a body or like another like body that is like seen as lower like how is punishment okay see the okay yeah so if the soul has done something wrong does it go into a body which is lower as a punishment the purpose is uh, of the whole this whole system of evolution it is not so much punishment as reformation it's not retribution you did this so you have to get this that's not the point the point is to elevate so if you understand that point that if we make a wrong choice it's not that we have to be condemned for the wrong choice but we are given a pathway by which we can make a right choice again so just like if say we are using gps to drive to a destination and then the gps tells us turn right and if we turn left then gps doesn't say get lost <laughs> <laughs> the gps immediately reroutes tells us now you take this route from here so if we do something wrong now why do we do something wrong it's because that desire is very strong hmm? that, that that we have that desire or the belief underlying that desire that by doing this i will get pleasure and therefore we do it so then we all have certain conceptions of what will give us pleasure and those activities make that pleasure doesn't last for long so so if somebody has done something wrong see here wrong is not so much in the sense of morally right or wrong wrong is that which is unfavorable for our spiritual evolution so we all have certain beliefs of what is enjoyable but the bhakti tradition explains that learning to love the divine is what is supremely enjoyable so if we have certain other ideas of what is enjoyable and we do certain actions related with that then we will be get, get put into situations where that desire can be played out abundantly and then one understands i thought this was enjoyable this is not all that enjoyable so for example if somebody is madly in love with swimming swimming is good as exercise swimming is good as recreation but if somebody is mad after that then the human body is not very suited for swimming we can't swim constantly so maybe given the body of aquatic where the soul can be constantly in water Now, for us, swimming might seem to be very enjoyable, but for an aquatic, swimming is just what naturally do. But there is danger in that. There are bigger predator of aquatics which may eat it. So, basically, if we have a very strong desire, uh, then we are given an opportunity to play out that desire, by which we can realize that this desire is nothing all that great. And then we do course correction, and then we again come back. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Is one question behind? Yeah. One in the back and one in the front. Sure. Um, if what happens if you have a really strong attachment to another person, and also if you have like multiple attachments when you die? 
Okay, can we have multiple attachments or what happens if you have a strong attachment to a person? See, the point here is not to not have attachments. It is to see our relationships in the context of the bigger purpose. As I said, there are horizontal relationships and vertical relationships. To have horizontal relationships is natural. But the ideal situation is where the horizontal relationship strengthens our vertical relationships. That means we are attached to someone who is also spiritually minded, who is also devotionally minded. Then both can together evolve spiritually. And then the attachment to the other person, so if the other person is also spiritual, being attached to that person can help us, they will remind us to spiritualize our consciousness, to become to gain a better perspective in our life. So, we the whole idea is not to become detached in the sense of becoming hard hearted or uncaring. The idea is to evolve. So, we, if we have multiple attachments, it's natural. All of us have relationships. But there is a beautiful prayer which says that Tomeva mata cha pita tomeva, Tomeva bandhu cha sakha tomeva, Tomeva vidya dravinam tomeva, Tomeva sarvam mama deva deva. What it means is, O oh Lord, you are my father, you are my mother, you are my, you are my brother, you are my friend, you are my wealth, you are my knowledge, you, O oh Lord, are my everything. What that means is that we get effects from our resources, wealth and knowledge. But whatever we are getting from it, it's ultimately the divine giving it to us. One of the closest acts of love is when a mother has a newborn child and the mother feeds the child her own breast milk. She is nursing a product of her body with a part of her body. It is very intimate and yet if you think deeply about it, the mother did not do anything special to produce milk in her breasts at that time. The same divine who send a child into the world through her womb has also sent milk in her womb to feed. So the idea is these horizontal relationships and the vertical relationships needn't be in competition. It's not that we have to give these up to take this up. But rather we see that these horizontal relationships can also be gifts of the divine. And if we don't get stuck over there, yes, this person loves me so much and I love them. That's true. And this love is a glimpse of the love that awaits me if I connect with the divine. There is a story in one of the bhakti texts where a child is neglected by her, his father and insulted by his stepmother. And he goes to his mother and his mother is powerless to help him. And she tells him that if you go to the divine, if you go to Krishna, he can offer you more love than what millions of mothers like me can offer. The idea is her love for his child is real, but she recognizes that with all my love, I cannot help at this point. So she does not limit the child to her love alone. She uses her love for her child to direct the child towards Krishna, towards the divine. So we can have multiple attachments, but if we see we can have multiple relationships with different people and actually there will be affection within those relationships, but if we see these relationships as that we are getting a glimpse of the love which can come from the divine through these relationships. Then the experience of fulfillment in those relationships can also inspire us to devote ourselves to the vertical relationship. Okay? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what is the view of uh, Advaita Vedanta or the concept of afterlife? Okay. What is the concept of uh, afterlife in Advaita Vedanta? Okay. There is, uh, there are, in the broad Indian tradition, you could call the Hindu tradition, the nature of reality is seen to be as oneness, that we are all one. Now, the idea of oneness is universal. Hmm? The details of how we are one, that is different. So, in Advaita Vedanta, which is one school of thought, there it is said that oneness means, say like, like right now I am observing you. Hmm? So in this act, there are three things. There is the, there is the 
subject of consciousness i am looking at you there is the object of consciousness and there is the stream of consciousness so the subject object and stream so now oneness uh, in the bhakti yoga tradition means that we the other person and the the stream of consciousness all these are parts of the divine so we could so we are all parts of the divine that's the understanding which the bhagavad gita gives us advaita vedanta holds that the subject is not there the object is not there only the stream of consciousness is there so oneness is accepted by both but the nature of oneness nature of oneness that idea is different so we could say there is a evolution in theism some people say there is no god some people say there are many gods some people say there is one god and some people say there is only god so no god many gods one god only god so only god now what does it mean the bhakti yoga tradition explains that we are all parts of the divine so within the divine there is variety so whether within the oneness there is variety or there is no variety that is the main difference but everybody accepts there is oneness if we consider our longing for love which is so deep rooted to us if there is no subject and there is no object then there is no possibility for love but if you understand the subject is eternal the object is eternal then it opens the door for eternal love okay thank you Yeah. I was just wondering when you die, how does our soul compare to the souls of our cells and at what point does our soul re-enter into a new body? Okay. So at what point does the soul re-enter into a new body? It depends as I said on karma. The soul mm, can you you change the slide show mm -hmm. and uh, the, the last two slides I have hidden them. Can you just show them? This can lead to a whole and a uh, whole pandora's box of questions but see what happens is just the last slide the second last so basically this world view also explains what are ghosts so when a soul leaves a body and the soul has to get an next body now the soul has to do some karma it's like when we if we have a old dress which is torn and we want to buy a new dress we have to get the money to buy a new dress otherwise we will have to live without a dress so like that if the soul leaves one body and the soul is not yet entitled to get the next body then the soul may live in a disembodied state so normally what i said that that state is a state of transition it just lasts for a few moments or a few minutes or a few days till the soul goes to a new body but sometimes the soul may stay in that body for a long time and if the soul uh, or the soul, soul may stay not in that body but in that state So when the soul has a mind but no body that is what is called as a ghost a ghost is basically a disembodied being there is no physical body and it's a ghost sir when we think about ghosts either we don't believe in them or we feel scared about them but actually the ghosts are themselves in a state of great distress why because say if there is a if there is a feast and everybody is enjoying food and suppose you have got a severe stomach upset and you can't eat anything seeing everybody else eating and not being able to eat is a state of misery so the for the for the soul and the ghost state it's like that the soul may see people enjoying things the soul may see somebody eating a delicious dessert but the soul has no physical tongue to eat the dessert so it's a state of great distress so especially say it's uh, the, we are given a particular body to live in for a particular time so i suppose somebody is supposed to live for 60 years and if at the age of 20 they commit suicide then for the next 40 years they are not meant to get a new body their next body would come after the age of 60 so that's 40 years they may have to live as a ghost and in that state they may be in a they will be in a state of great distress Like having a lot of desires, but having no means to fulfill the desires. Go to the next slide. So sometimes some such souls can enter into a body and possess a body. So possession means what? In one body at that time there are two souls. 
so one the, the one soul becomes dormant there are many well documented scientifically documented cases also of people who suddenly behave differently i know a person in mumbai in a city in india and this lady she was born in maharashtra the local dialect there was there was marathi and once she woke up one day and started speaking in a masculine voice i started speaking bengali which is a language in another part of india which she had never been to and there are many cases like this so what happens in such cases the other person enters into the body and that person temporarily takes over the body and that that's how what we call as possession some people get possessed and that possession may stay for some time and then when the soul has gratified whatever desire it has the soul will leave that body so normally the transition from one body to another happens in a short time it depends on which body the soul is going to go to if the soul is going to another human body then the transition is relatively straightforward if the soul is going to go to another non human body then the soul's conception has to be changed so that it can adapt to that body so that takes some time but if the soul is to stay in a disembodied state then that may take some more time so that's why exactly there is no predictable fixed time duration for the soul to go from one body to another body it varies from case to case okay so Jenny, can you hear what's going on they're closing their books and stuff <laughs> they do this to me too uh, it's our it's our cue that we're done um, so okay. we are out of time are you do you have a few more minutes if students have one sure. question sure sure yeah, so here. if you have some more questions come on up but otherwise we'll be dismissed let's uh, show our appreciation